I guess uh, in terms of like an introduction to to Marx's theory, um, like my first note that I put down is that it's really hard to uh, compartmentalize Marxism uh, to even like you know say to speak of like Marxist economics or like Marxist politics. I and mean, obviously those disciplines all exist, um, but because of the very interdisciplinary nature of Marx's own work and the subsequent works that followed, it's really hard to, you know, to pinpoint areas that are, that are really uh, specific to, um, to a discipline. For example, like obviously class and class struggle are uh, so important to Marx's analysis, but that is essentially like an, a pervasive element in every, uh, every part of this discussion, whether it's economic or political or, uh, philosophical. So when I was like putting together a list of things that are worth mentioning and like where they belong, like where they're situated in Marxist theory, uh, that's like kind of what stood out to me that, um, you know, it's difficult to, to talk about it without talking about it all at once. And then the, the, that's kind of, I think felt by a lot of people who are just starting out reading Marx or like Marxist theory of any kind is that it's, it's, it is a little overwhelming in terms of, um, getting, a getting getting your bearing and understanding like um okay how is this concept connected to this concept and like how is this concept embedded in a larger sort of like uh, th uh theory or tendency um so i think if i had to start with a location within marx's thought i would say probably economics um that's kind of where a lot of other a lot of the uh concepts that branch out start with economics. And I don't think it's an accident that uh, I think, well, I guess it's arguable, but uh, Marx's most mature work, Capital, in its three volumes, Unfinished, is a uh, dominantly economic text. Uh, obviously, there are so many different readings of it. Um, but I think with that preface, I think the economics of Marxism is probably the best place to start. But I'll get back to like, um, sort of, uh, understanding good entry points because obviously it's not going to work for everyone to start with economics if that's not what they're interested in and it's not like their area of expertise or what they're primarily focused on um but uh in terms of economics i think that um uh, of course there are a lot of important texts that marx wrote that sort of like are the foundation of marx's theory in this particular discipline but really, uh, my opinion is that capital is uh, is it's a good it's a good place to reference in terms of what Marx wanted to start investigating first. And again, this kind of goes back to the idea that uh, it's such a massive totality that's so deeply interconnected that you uh, it's really difficult. Even for Marx, it was really difficult to find a spot to to begin his investigation, and um, the the commodity is where Marx ultimately started his investigation, uh, and this is for a variety of reasons. I know there's a couple people who like uh, really delve into why Marx chose the commodity first. I think the Harvey lectures on YouTube and uh, basically just transcribed into his books, like companions guides to uh, uh, capital. They're a good place to sort of understand why Marx chose the commodity, but um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's not new to Marx the the concept of the commodity and how he uses it and um, a lot you'll find that in studying uh, all of the economic concepts that Marx develops that quite a lot of it is very mm, it's very responsive to his contemporaries and his predecessors obviously like Smith Ricardo and uh, a lot of the other economists that he very frequently mentions and. Uh, he is quite um he's quite generous with them and at the same time very very critical so it's interesting to see where he uh draws the line on what the what his predecessors and contemporaries were able to uh discover and what they failed to see essentially uh so from the commodity after he kind of gives it an outline um that's where we get sort of the first discussion of what is a really major topic, I guess, in Marxist theory, even today, 
which is value and value theory. Uh, and this is actually where I feel like a lot of people are um, not confused, but uh, there's just a lot, of, a lot that goes into this. Um, there's a lot of people who uh, often ask me questions about, you know, for example, the issues between value and price, and the uh, a transformation problem, as it's called, like how how does Marx's uh, system of value um, correspond with or connect to the price system? that we're familiar with, you know, just market prices and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I think labor theory of value, also not uh, a uniquely Marxist concept, obviously, um, is, and it's interesting in, in that it, I think it leads some people to expect a very mechanistic and um, reductive understanding of value in Marx's terms. Um, but in my explorations of, you know, the other two volumes, not just volume one and, you know, secondary texts, it's apparent to me that, uh, Marx's value theory is more complicated than, you know, just like labor put in labor put out and like labor and value are like strictly, um, connected to each other. Um, and I, a lot of, a lot of major, uh, writers and thinkers since Marx have, talked about this obviously and I'm, I'm sure most of you are to some degree familiar with like the debates regarding the transformation problem which are really like fixated on understanding marx's value system um you know you've got like the temporal single system interpretation by andrew Kleiman and uh fred mosley's macro monetary theory uh so there's like a lot of people who've picked up on this um well, some people argue it's a discrepancy in his in marx's logic other people think that there's no discrepancy at all and uh, this, it's like a, it's like a whole lecture in and of itself, honestly, value theory. Um, and it can be that that's one of the places where I think beginners might find uh, themselves overwhelmed, I guess, because there's so much like background debate that's going on before Marx even comes into it. And um, there's just so much to read and expose yourself to to really understand um, value theory from a Marxist perspective. I think that uh, my, my perspective on the value theory, I, I'm personally inclined towards like uh, Andrew Kleiman's TSSI. Um, and I think it is not incompatible with Fred Mosley's macro monetary theory, uh, both of which essentially argue that like prices and values don't exist in separate systems. You know, there isn't like a value system that's separate to, but maybe connected with price. Um, and I think that there's a lot of textual evidence for this in volume three, especially. Uh, and I'll get to the other two volumes shortly here. But I don't want to like, there's so much to cover. I don't know like <laughs> what to focus on the most, but um, I really recommend people to read both volume two and three. I know a lot of people stop at volume one or at parts of volume one. And I know that it's like, it's easy to say, oh, just read all three volumes as if like, that's, a, that's an easy thing easy task to accomplish. Um, but the reason I say that and the reason I recommend it for people is because um, Marx's uh, labor theory of value as it's presented in Capital Volume 1 is like deliberately incomplete. Um, because he's uh, talking about this totality, this entire system, he doesn't have, he hasn't developed in its entirety in, in his like perception of that, you know, and his understanding of it. And it's really only once you get to volume three that you begin to understand with prices of production, uh, which are essentially like, you know, the, the final prices of a commodity, um, how that, how prices uh, reflect back onto the production process. And so you've got Fred Mosley, who uh, first started the uh, macro monetary interpretation, who argues that um, money is sort of the foundation of Marx's discussion on like the labor process and value theory. So uh, it's in, in, in terms of money and um, by emphasis on money that Marx uh, elaborates on, on the MCM cycle and um, all of the like variants of that process. Um, so his argument is essentially that the, the prices of uh, commodities and constant capital and variable capital that go into the production process necessarily influence um, the values that come out of them. Because of course, if you got if you have a constant capital that changes in its price, you, that's going to reflect in the like final um, 
value of the new commodity of the new cycle of production um and then again this is like there's a lot to this um and i'm just rushing through it so it's not a good uh overview but i'm just trying to uh kind of paint uh like an imp a impressionistic map i guess of um what's out there for people to read and uh this is this is particularly valuable to me because this is like an area where a lot of people that are coming from like an like an anti-Marxist perspective, I guess, or like a skeptical perspective, they'll point to like the labor theory of value and how Marx doesn't account for supply and demand and doesn't like care about prices, which is of course not true at all. If you read like really any of volume three, um, he goes into pretty great depth on those relationships. And for me personally, like the textual evidence really suggests that um, the final model for his value theory is like dialectical, which, um, you know, I. I'm pretty partial to that. Uh, I think Kleiman and M Mosley to a certain degree, but Kleiman especially talks about how um, you can't really have uh, an interpretation of Marx of, of this portion of Marx's theory without being true to Marx's method, which is inherently dialectical. And if it is inherently dialectical, then then the systems of value and price are really one system that uh have like reciprocal ends that like reflect on each other so you know value determines the like brackets or the par parameters for price and and price in turn changes you know values as it enters into production um so i'm starting to ramble on this but um this is just like a really major area of focus for a lot of marxist economists and um it's definitely a place that a lot of people get stuck on especially if they've only read certain parts of marx um, without reading like the most mature, like sort of final uh, points on this particular discussion. Um, so in closing the, the, the topic of economics, because there's just, there's too much to go into. Um, I really strongly suggest uh, even beginners to work their way up to being able to read um, all three volumes eventually. And it's a really long-term project. It took me many years to read all the necessary secondary texts and um, really familiarize myself with the theory and familiarize myself with the way that Marx writes. All of that is very painstaking, but um, you, it's really, it's really uh, I think, it's a fatal mistake to disregard the latter two volumes because there's a lot in there that... Um, complicates the theory and um, gives it um, a lot more depth than it gets in the first volume, which again is a deliberate choice made by Marx. He develops his argument, um, Harvey argues dialectically, um, across the three volumes. So it's essentially like if you read only, if you like listen to only the first third of a lecture, you know, and didn't uh, listen to the other t two parts, um, there's nothing like wrong with it, but you should understand that that you're missing key points there, and that from there, obviously, there's portions of volume three and two that are incomplete because Marx obviously never finished them. So that's where you read like the secondary stuff and the the Marxist theorists that followed Marx. Um, but yeah, I I strongly strongly encourage people to read uh, at at their own pace with as much supporting material as is needed all three volumes because there's a lot in there and it's all really useful. Um, yeah, so that's Marxist economics, um, in the broadest of senses. Uh, and I left the discussion on capital, uh, because it's such a, it's one of those concepts that really overlaps with all the other sort of spheres, um, that aren't, it isn't just economic necessarily. So I'll talk about that maybe towards the end. Um, and then, uh, moving on, I think another area that's very commonly focused on by beginners and really anyone who's interested um, including like uh, very like cursory glances at Marxism in conventional textbooks is like Marxist theory in politics and sort of like Marxist conception of the state, um, class struggle, geopolitics, all of that stuff. Um, so there, again, there's just a lot to say here. Uh, all I can really do is point people in the right direction in terms of like what to read and um, what what are the major questions uh, in this particular discipline. And uh, I think the state is still a really pertinent sort of battleground within Marxist circles and outside of them in terms of understanding uh, the theory there. Um, 
And I think most of you probably know that Marx himself didn't spend much time writing about the state. Uh, that really came after him. Uh, Lenin made major contributions there. And then uh, you had the debates between uh, Puances and, God, I always forget the name of the other guy. Uh, there was like mid 20th century debates and then more contemporary stuff. Um, and uh, the initial, I guess, like common, unfortunately, interpretation, sometimes deliberately reductive if it's coming from a non Marxist perspective. Uh, interpretation of the state in Marxist sense is, uh, you know, a tool that is entirely or exclusively controlled by one group um, targeting another group, specifically the, you know, the dominant class targeting the uh, subjugated class. And uh, I think to varying degrees, there's, uh, it's applicable, especially if you look further back in history. But I think that there's been a lot of important contributions that have been made that have sort of expanded on that issue and uh, focused on passages in Marx and Engels that uh, offer more nuance and understanding for what the state is, how it operates, um, what connections does it actually have, the dominant class, uh, what its role is in capitalism, what its role is in the accumulation of capital itself. Um, so there's a lot to talk about there, um, but I, I think in terms of uh, my takeaway from research and, and readings that I've done is um, I, I'm definitely more inclined to believe that there that there is like a uh, that that you can really only understand the state in Marxism in non uh, binary non dichotomous senses, and that there is like a sort of push and pull in relationship with uh, the state mechanism in terms of the classes that are involved, um, which isn't to say necessarily that it's like the equal playing ground that you would read about in uh, like conventional uh, theories of the state, um, like the more pluralistic ones that uh, think that there's just multiple groups vying for power and the state is like a battleground for that um, somewhat equal exchange. Uh, I don't obviously I don't think that that's uh, that's entirely accurate because uh, those groups or classes or whatever aren't coming into it with uh, with the same kinds of resources and the same kinds of. Um, yeah, the same kinds of circumstances, I guess. Uh, so that's where I think that the, the Marxist tradition is um, it sets itself apart, I guess, from other like more conventional political theories on the state. Um, and then, of course, uh, throughout most of Marxist theory, you have like a very carefully contextualized articulation of the varying like institutions in society, including the state. So, you know, the state isn't like an, an eternal sort of unchangeable uh, institution that acts the same way across history and uh, re responds to different inputs and outputs the same way. So like the capitalist state is different from, you know, a socialist state, if there is one, depending on how you perceive the definitions um, and, you know, the states that preceded capitalism. Uh, so that's a pretty critical difference between Marxism and non-Marxist theories, which tend to essentialize the state and really a lot of other uh, social concepts. Um, but yeah, uh, this this is definitely a location where class struggle comes through uh, and is interwoven really, in, like I said, in all the disciplines. But uh, regardless of like how nuanced or not nuanced or what like perspective Marxists hold on the state and its role in capitalism, um, class struggle is like a very critical element there. Uh, it's still like a whether you believe that the state is like exclusively in the hands of one class or another, or it's like more. Um, contentious than that there's that's still sort of like the the uh central paradigm i suppose um and then from the discussions about the state you get into theories regarding geopolitical conflicts and like the question of imperialism um obviously that was first popularized by lenin and um I can never pronounce this guy's name, but Hilford Ding or uh, another Marxist uh, theorist who was uh, close in, in Lenin in terms of time time period. And they both worked out the idea of like monopoly capital and um, how 
the like accumulation of capital in one sort of like nationally bound location, like a nation state, uh, is then used to is then exported to other places. Um, so that sort of became the springboard for um, further elaboration. And I don't think that there was much discussion on it until the latter half of the 20th century, where Marxist IR really started looking at, um, uh, for example, there's like dependency theory um, and uh, world systems theory, uh, which are all like really big. I don't know that I have the time or really the eligibility to talk about them in depth, but um, yeah, it's sort of like taking the ideas of the nation state and um, uh, contrasting them, comparing them to the uh, dynamics of capital and how like does the nation like do nation states uh, completely subject are completely subjected to the paradigms of capital, which is um, one of the theses that's uh, more recent uh, that like kind of say that the era of the nation state is waning and that we've got like a transnational capital and transna and the transnational capitalist class that like tran like tran um, transcends uh, the nation state as we know it. Um, and then there's other people like in the new imperialist camp, which are like David Harvey and Ellen Woods and uh, a bunch of other people um, who argue that there's kind of like two uh, paradigms in geopolitics you've got like the concept of the nation state and like the the state the nation state sort of looking out for its interests and like maximizing its uh its rewards and minimizing its damages which is a really like realist interpretation if you're familiar with international relations it's very like uh it's very like reductive to the power sense of geopolitics and then you've got the other angle for geopolitics which is um you know the way that the capital sort of erases national boundaries. So that's like a discussion that's, I think, pretty ongoing still. And if you, you have questions on that afterwards, I'd be happy to elaborate. This is, again, just like a lot to talk about in an overview. Um, and then I guess uh, next on the list that I had was uh, Marxist history, which really uh, all of marxist discussions on like economics politics sociology they're very historically based because uh M marxism i think tends not to like essentialization and uh it tends to reject like universal concepts universal uh um institutions uh it likes to explain um social phenomenon and like social formations and social relations as uh in, in a periodized sense you know there's like a capitalist form of things a pre-capitalist you know post-capitalist and that these that these uh social entities they're they're different across time not necessarily punctuated like in like a strict rupture you know where they totally change it's uh pretty evolutionary but um I would say that like all of Marx's like economics, politics, et cetera, it's very historical. It's very based on the idea that we can't disregard like uh, the historical evolutions of each of these um, areas, these spheres, like politics, the state, the you know evolution of the state, the evolution of uh, uh, economics and like economic paradigms and like how capital came to be, um, the way that it is in the capitalist mode of production. Um, and that kind of touches on in history, um, in Marxist history, like theories of transitions and how those transitions happen. Uh, obviously, one of the most contentious places in that discussion uh, is the theory of transitioning to socialism and communism. There's a lot of debate about that pretty much anywhere you look in terms of like Marxist communities. Um, there's a variety of different interpretations of how transitions happen. Um, my personal take, again, based on what I've read and um, what I've uh, heard from other people, other like scholars who read about this stuff, um, is that the transitions are uh, not neat. They're not uh, total. Um, that essentially modes of production can exist, coexist. You know, there can be a capitalist mode of production that exists somewhat simultaneously with like pre-capitalist modes of production or you know, socialist modes of production. 
and that these um, territories, they kind of like grow and recede. Um, and uh, Marx's analysis of capitalism acknowledges the fact that capital is like the dominant form at this point economically. And I think that's like pretty obviously true even in our time. Um, so that, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the capitalist mode of production is found everywhere, you know, in every facet of society, in every part of the world. Uh, and I actually just read some interesting stuff about the ways in which capital and the capitalist mode of production uh, incorporate non-capitalist production processes and extract surplus value from them without necessarily transforming them to be capitalists themselves. So this like these relationships, these like uh, social relations and the productive mechanisms, they can coexist to a degree. And the transitionary periods are uh, sort of the, the, the points in, in history in time where um, one surpasses the other and becomes dominant, quote unquote. Um, so that's my take on like transitions, theory of transitions. Um, and for me, that really um, lends itself to a very anti-determinist, anti-linear uh, understanding of Marxist theory. There's like a couple uh, quotes that I recall putting down in my notes when I was reading volume two and three and a couple other places that really stood out to me as Marx arguing that while there is like a um, an explainable trajectory between modes of production and just an explainable trajectory for history, um, you it's not like linear, it's not guaranteed. And uh, I think that that particular tendency in Marx's argument is more pronounced in his later works than his earlier works. And I'm going to controversially say that that this that um in marx's mature um discourse you'll find a lot more sort of like gray area in terms of like uh is there a specific trajectory for history and he talks in multiple occasions about like like i said like the coexistence of different modes of production different social processes for example he talks about how commercial capital used to be kind of like the dominant capital uh the, like the dominant framework in um pre-capitalist eras and then capital like in terms of its like, industrial sense what he calls industrial capital which is like capitalism as we know it um expanded to become the dominant form and incorporated commercial capital which is like merchant trading and stuff like that um into its framework and so um but that necessarily didn't have to happen that way you know so um the question of determinism, it, I, I run into pretty frequently where people think, okay, we had feudalism and we had capitalism and then we have socialism, you know, that it's like a, like a neat sort of jigsaw puzzle that goes forward. And there's like a, like a teleology, which gets into like some of the philosophy of, of Marxism as well. Uh, and that's also very contentious, but, uh, but there's like an end point, you know, and then the history has been evolving ac across like a, a necessary um, framework, you know, that, that eventually there's going to be this and this period that necessarily has to uh, proceed from what we have now. Um, and I think that there's a, there is a degree of, of, uh, of determinism, but it's very, um, it's like restricted, you know, like it's deterministic in the sense that the conditions that we have now are necessarily like framing a particular type of transformation, but that doesn't mean that down the road that, everything is determined just that what comes immediately after the circumstances that we're in now economically and politically is obviously dictated by um the structures that exist right now and the way that they like interact with each other so uh that's my take on like history and like the transitions that occur in theory in, in history uh, according to a marxist perspective and i guess that kind of brings me to philosophy I'm just kind of jumping around my notes because there's just, uh, yeah, there's so much to, so many entry points for Marxism. Um, but on the issue of like teleology, you get into um, sort of like Marx's understanding of the world in a bigger sense, like Marxist ontology and um, how, like the sort of meta conversation of Marx's theory, like what were his like core assumptions about the way the world works. And uh, this is where I feel least comfortable, um, not because I haven't done any reading, but on the contrary, because I've done 
uh, so much in the recent past that I feel very agnostic about this. And I know that some people are very confident about, oh yeah, no, Marx saw the world sort of like this way. Uh, this is a specific ontology or this is a specific epistemology. But uh, I, I really, like, for, for my own sake, don't want to make any uh, strong claims here. Um, but uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion um, that's worth reading. Um, those of you who've heard me rant about him before, I like a lot of what Althusser has to say in terms of Marxist philosophy and the people that he influenced. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, consider him to be completely correct in every sense of um, of his theories and contributions. But if any of you are familiar with Althusser, you'll realize that I'm influenced by him in terms of like anti-determinism, anti-linearity, um, and like over-determinism is also an interesting concept that I can talk about more in the questions or uh, after I finish ranting. Um, and I guess another like, and that kind of like uh, touches on another issue in Marxist philosophy, which is the degree to which Hegel influenced Marx and is like Marx, like a, uh, like a Hegelian to, to, was he a Hegelian to his like final days or did he evolve past Hegelianism? Um, also on a similar note, was Marx like an enlightenment thinker? Was he a liberal? Um, which there's merits to all of these arguments and there's no way to really weigh in on it without reading a lot of uh, the background, a lot of the, a lot of Hegel, a lot of the liberal thinkers that Marx was influenced by undoubtedly. Um, but those are discussions that are still worth having, in my opinion. They're not necessarily as pertinent as like the sort of practical political discussions, but they're still, you know, it, it, it helps us frame our reading of Marx and the subsequent th theories and concepts that he's influenced that may not even necessarily be Marxist, you know, that may be like influenced by Marx or whatever. Um, so there's, there's a lot of discussion there. Was Marx like a humanist? Um, are there anti-humanist strains or like non-humanist, you know, strains in Marxism? Um, obviously there are now, but, um, yeah, these are all questions that are, that sort of blow up into their own topics, I guess. Um, uh, another topic that is very interesting to me, and I think a lot of other people are interested in it is sociologically like alienation, reification, um, the ways that. The, the capitalist mode of production and capital um, form our like psyches and uh, the kinds of social implications they have, these structures and systems have on us personally, our like mental states, our relationships with other people, um, which isn't like a strictly psychological thing. It's, you know, it's, it's so sociological as well. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big area. I know. Uh, I found Lukács' work personally quite interesting on this subject. Um, and there's a lot of other people who write about alienation. I think Bertolt Ullman wrote a good book on this as well, Eric Fromm. Um, I think most, um, most alienation work comes from like the humanist Marxist tradition, um, but you will find it like in anti-humanist tradition as well i mean like people like officer have wrote about it as well um but it's it's an interesting topic because it's just so it's so easy to feel for people and i think that in terms of entry points that's one place where uh without knowing too much theory you can read into it and uh sort of gauge it without uh without needing much primers, I guess. But I could be wrong. I mean, that's certainly an arguable point to make. Um, and then this is, uh, this is, this is the problem with uh, having like one person present. I feel like uh, I have my own biases and uh, that's why I've left like aesthetics and like discussions of like the arts fairly untouched. And that's just largely because I personally haven't read enough about it. But I do think that it's important to like understand the you know like the frank frankfurt school i don't know how many of you've heard of that i uh, term but you know it's like a group of scholars marxist scholars people who are influenced by marx who wrote on you know uh, literary theory and art and aesthetics um media and the way that that all works with society how society influences those um uh objects and 
mediums, I guess. And uh, it's something that I personally want to explore more, but I can't talk to you guys too much about it because I know so little. I've just really only uh, exposed myself to it by periphery of reading other things. So, but I will say that it's out there. And for those of you who are interested in that particular type of discussion, that's also a good place to start if that's something that you're already familiar with. Um, so that kind of like, uh, that kind of wraps up like my really brief overviews of the different kinds of sections of Marxism that I guess you could get into. Um, so I have like a couple like major, like big picture points, and then like a summary of like key elements of Marxism. Uh, but one one thing that I always say to myself and some of my friends say to me when we're like reading these theories and getting ourselves more acquainted with different parts of Marxist theory is that there's no royal road to science, which is what it's like, a you know, a part of Marx's um, quote. I don't remember where he wrote that, but um, just the idea that you really got to get your hands dirty to understand these concepts. There's not like an easy way to like learn any of this and it is it is like a pretty serious engagement um you can obviously determine for yourself the degree to which you want to be involved in reading these things and educating yourself but the issue of course is that uh, we're not really taught any of this stuff in the schools that we attend in um, any of the media that we consume conventionally so uh the burden of research the burden of understanding all this really falls on you and you have to decide to what degree you want to involve yourself but um, in my experience, the more that I read, the more questions I ended up getting about like, okay, so this concept, I don't really understand it. I need to go read about that. And I read like a couple people who wrote about that and then realize that they're borrowing concepts that I don't understand, you know? So it's like a, so, um, yeah, just to, don't be afraid to get lost in that. And, uh, it's not going to be easy, I guess, which is like, I, I really want to say that that it's obviously not unique to Marxism, but going back to my very first point, because of the way that Marx's sort of argument was developed by him specifically, it's so like all encompassing that there's no way to just um, sort of in, in, in isolation, understand one sphere and not another, because they're all just super connected. Um, and that brings me to the idea, the theme that you should pick what you're interested in and go from there, whether it's history, politics or economics, arts, whatever it is. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that you will probably need to be familiar with like the economic side of things. And uh, I dare say that really, if you want to get super well read on Marxism, you're not going to be able to avoid reading the three volumes eventually in some capacity, because that's just like where a lot of the other stuff comes from, even the stuff that isn't strictly economic or political. Um, and I mean, yeah, uh, so in terms of like key concepts of Marxism that you should probably all ask me questions about after this, um, you know, Marx's concept of class and class struggle, uh, Marxist dialectics, uh, materialism, I put over determinism in there because I think that like that really fits in with those. It really helps like kind of tie those things together. Um, and just like the social totality that Marx is trying to explain. Um, it's just very complex. And uh, but it is like a key feature in Marx. If you read any of his stuff, he's not fixated on one area and he can't be by virtue of the kind of argument he's trying to make. And lastly, this is like the point that I emphasize at the end of all of my videos, uh, praxis, the idea of uh, Marxism not just being like an armchair philosophy. Uh, it certainly can be if that's what you want it to be. But uh, in my opinion, I think the, the point of it is um, to be practical and to apply that theory to real world conditions and to effectively transform the circumstances around us. So um, that's that's all I have in terms of overview. Obviously, we can do like questions. I can get into specific stuff to the degree that I'm able. But um, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, so I think this is kind of like uh, it's kind of like a new new ish um, sub uh concentration i guess in marxism i recently 
touched up on some of this stuff, some of the more recent works. Um, and uh, first of all, I definitely will say that um, the Leninist conception of geopolitics, of like imperialism, to a large degree has to be revised uh, to the modern circumstances. The financial global financial system is just so vastly different. And I really personally see an appeal to the um, the idea of multinational corporations, right? Of uh, sort of like the, 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 the transnational capital, which is different from international capital. I, I recall one of the articles I read was very specific about that. It's not a conglomeration or a unity. It's that 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 um, the capital transce transcends the nation and uh, replaces it. Now, everyone that I've read on this, every scholar that I've read on this, has been like very optimistic and like uh, uh, what's the word for it? Like confident that we're like at the end of the nation state. That there is no nation state. Or, like it's basically in the past. And I think that that's not true for obvious reasons. Uh, we're seeing like a resurgence of like isolationism and like the sort of redrawing the nation state as a boundary. I mean, I think like the UK is a pretty clear example of a uh, territory where the project of transnational capital of like unifying nation states along like a broad multinational capital flow has sort of fallen apart or received some resistance. Uh, and I think it's the case here in the United States where I am as well. Um, there's, I mean, if you want specific texts, there's one really good one. Uh, that's like a collection of essays of contemporary scholars looking at this, these particular questions. It's called um, Marxism and Global Politics. Marxism and Global Politics. I've shared this in my server, so maybe someone has already seen it by... A Anivas. It's actually like a bunch of different scholars, not just this one guy, Anivas. Um, but they have like a variety of different perspectives that all sort of see their foundations in the earlier theories, like Leninist theory of imperialism. But pretty much all of them at this point are like that, you know, there's more to to the global political and economic world than uh than you know, Lenin saw in his time. And it's not by failure of his analysis, it's just that the world is different, obviously. Like, for example, we don't even have like a gold back currency anymore. It's uh it's a floating currency in most places. So um that in itself exploded the financial sphere to a point that it's totally unrecognizable from the kind of uh finances that existed in Lenin's time. So yeah, I really recommend that book. It's it's like really concise and it it uh, structures their arguments like in the form of like a back and forth debate almost and uh, lays it out in like two parts. Uh, it's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. If you want to learn more about like uh, transnational capital, nation states in capitalism, like what kind of relationships they have today and stuff like that. Yeah, I uh, had like a really brief foray into like uh environmentalist marxism and i haven't returned to it in a while um so philosophically there's a lot to say on that but practically speaking i really don't know i would say um i am personally partial to nuclear as like a transition period um because it is uh provided that we you know expand our research on it because it's not very cost efficient at the moment but uh i do think that nuclear is like a good significantly green, greener alternative to like hydrocarbon energy um but uh i really think that what's what's stopping us is um that the the necessity to transition to green energy is in conflict with capital as a paradigm you know and there's so many corporations that uh they want to be on board to a degree in terms of like uh, cornering that market for themselves, but as long as they're still making most of their revenues from hydrocarbons, from like oils, coal, and stuff like that, um, they're not going to allow for that development to really go in full swing. Um, so yeah, in terms of energy specifically, like what sources nuclear, I'm very not opposed to that. I think that's a good idea. I think it can be 
uh, properly harnessed. I know that in the Soviet Union for quite a while, that was sort of like the dominant, um, I don't know if necessarily for environmental reasons, but it was certainly like a very popular discussion about using nuclear energy. Uh, and then other countries that are not socialist have also gone on board pretty heavily on it, like France, I think, has a lot of nuclear energy. Um, yeah. An absolute beginner. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so hard. Um, <laughs> uh, it's been a while since I've been exposed to that uh, question, I guess. Uh, it's it's hard because, like, every introductory text that I've found is, like, very selfish in that it clearly sneaks in, like, its own agenda, like, its own sort of flavor of Marxism. <laughs> Um, there's one book that I liked that I was telling a lot of people to read called The Meaning of Marxism by Paul D'Amato. Um, Paul D'Amato. There it is. Um, oh, and I'll answer that question after this. Uh, it's a good book, Meaning of Marxism. Um, unfortunately, it is, it like kind of, betrays the author betrays himself and his position as like a trotskyist which i have absolutely nothing against that but in terms of like an introductory text i feel like that's really uh it's it's counterproductive to you know like he, he has like all these really good succinct de definitions and discussions of marxist concepts and then he gets to like the soviet union and just totally like trashes it um but it's like coming almost out of left field well literally and figuratively but um yeah it's uh it's a good book, but you just have to like take it with a grain of salt when you get to certain sections. Um, what else can I recommend? Oh, there's um, there's a Rutledge book, a Rutledge publication book. Uh, Rutledge is like a publication company. They like publish a lot of different textbooks uh, on Marxist economics. Um, let me look it up real quick so I remember the name. Marxist economics. There's a lot of major Marxist economists who contributed to it. Um, Let's see. I think it's literally just called the Rutledge Handbook of Marxian Economics. Um, let me paste that into the chat so people know. This is really good, too. Uh, the reason it's good is um, I actually have a copy of this. So if you guys want a copy of this on the down low, I can get that to you. Um, it's uh, got a lot of different scholars who write on the stuff that they know really well um and it really breaks down pretty much every concept in marxism you know especially on the economic end of things like uh every every major like point or section in the three volumes of capital whether it's like the commodity value theory or like transformation problem or like uh volume two stuff like circulation turnover so really good book for that i've used it a lot of times um yeah, uh, trying to think of anything else uh, that's like super introductory. I'm not sure. I, I don't. In terms of like works by Marx himself, uh, I I don't know where I fall on this question because on one hand I'm like just trying to jump into the pool completely, and you know don't just get your feet wet, just go for it. Um, but obviously, like that's so daunting. There's so much that. Uh, is difficult to understand outside of the context. Oh, I will, I will, um, looking at my stash of books now, I will recommend another book, Dance of the Dialectic by Bertolt. Hope I'm spelling his name right. Allman. Uh, this is um, not Marxist economics, it's uh, philosophy more. Uh, it's a somewhat Hegelian reading of Marx, but it's a really good book for understanding dialectics. It's, as far as I recall, pretty well suited to the layperson, someone who's not super exposed to Marxism. Um, so yeah, I would recommend that too, if you're interested in understanding dialectics. But yeah, I mean, with any of these texts, anything that you find that gears itself as an introductory book, introductory text, you're going to run into biases. And you're probably not going to see them as someone who doesn't know enough about this field, you know, about, about, about all of these theories, um, which is fine. I mean, this is somewhat unavoidable. I'm sure if I ever wrote 
anything like this, it would be much the same, just filled with biases. But um, yeah, those are those are all good. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and then I guess I was asked if Marx is a statist. Uh, from my readings, I would say it's really hard to m m make a concise case for either one because Marx, like, I can't recall too many places where Marx goes at length to describe the state. Um, and I think a lot of the Marxist works that have come after him have helped in elaborating this. Now you have Lenin, and again, Lenin, um, very sort of uh, perceptive, and I think he really captured his time perfectly. But you know he's not a prophet he's not he didn't see into the future he didn't see how capitalist capitalism developed past his uh historical point uh so to a degree i think that lenin's conception of the state isn't necessarily where the the capitalist state is today and i think if we're being true to uh marx's method without being dogmatic it's uh we should we should acknowledge that the capitalist state has and will continue to evolve um as capitalism continues to exist, even if it's not progressive evolution, it could be like regression or you know, a anti-development. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm 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 not I'm not sure I can pin him as one or the other. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, evidence in the texts to suggest that Marx did favor. Uh, sort of like a state control of uh, facets of the economy. But uh, at the same time, there's a lot of stuff in volume three where he talks a lot about like co-ops and actually also, yeah, of course. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> um, I'm just very hesitant with yes or no, just by, I just always read into it that way. <laughs> I'm sure you're not. Um, but Anyway, in volume three, uh, this this sh this shocked me actually when I read it. Uh, he talks about uh, co-ops a lot and um, joint stock companies, and he basically makes the argument from both positions, from like the capitalist standpoint and like the worker standpoint, that these two entities, um, sort of like have the structures within them to end capitalism, or at least to end private property, because you know on the one hand you have the joint stock company, which increasingly like socializes capital by making it owned by more than like one person, right? Or more than several people. And then on the other hand, you've got the co-op, which for obvious reasons uh, has stamps of um, non-capitalist productive frameworks. And um, he hints, but doesn't fully elaborate on the fact that these could be mechanisms that we use for, you know, transitioning past capitalism. And the co-op one is obviously quite popular and, uh, I've I have no issues with it whatsoever, uh, but the joint stock company one is it was a really jarring uh, example to me because he's basically like almost saying that uh, um, that like capital will socialize itself, <laughs> uh, and I don't know uh, I, m maybe it's because he didn't finish elaborating that point. I don't know to what degree that's true in the capitalism that we know today, uh, but those would be non-statist sort of in, uh, approaches to that, right? To developing socialism from uh, like an almost syndicalist perspective in terms of co-ops. And then something to that degree from the joint stock company side of things, just top down. But I really don't, I, I don't know. That, that that one is like the least developed in my opinion. Um, there's, uh, there was like another discussion he had that seemed to me to be very not like centralized. Uh, I can't remember now, but it's also in volume three. He has like uh, volume three is bizarre because you know it's not it wasn't completed. Um, so there's like a lot of passages where he just like starts saying these crazy things, and uh, I it's not really substantiated. Uh, it's just I don't know. It's not his fault. He didn't mean to die before finishing them, but uh, it leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on to some of the other questions. Um, okay, what are your thoughts on Freudo-Marxism? Um, this is, uh, this is a, another area where I am not confident in making definitive, uh, 
statements because I am not well read on it whatsoever. All I can say is that I'm aware of its existence and it is very interesting. Uh, my my only real exposure to it is when I read um, Reading Capital, which is by Officer and his gang, essentially, um, by Lavar, Astablay, Masheray, Rancière. Um, and they briefly, they actually borrow from Freud a lot. And I think that they may have been the ones who really brought Freud into Marxism in the latter half of the 20th century in the French traditions. Um, they brought in Freud, they brought in Lacan, they brought in a couple other, um, I guess, like popular at the time thinkers, Freud being one of them. Um, so it's interesting, and I also can't really even recall. I, t I remember taking some notes on that, um, but I already don't remember what what it was that fascinated me about it. So I just, I don't want to say too much about it. I just, it is interesting though. Um, this, this looks like another question. Familiar with the concepts of exchange value, use value. It's in line with capitalist and subjective value. And I definitely agree with Marx's analysis of values, origin being socially required labor, but I'd like to know if there was a good way to quantify this objective value in practice. Yeah, I've heard this question pretty frequently. You know, can we, uh, mobilize Marx's like theoretical sort of abstract questions on value and like his propositions on value into like a mathematical reality, like something that we can actually measure to some degree. Um, there's, I know there's some thinkers that like just in principle disagree with that. <laughs> uh, they don't think that there is a way to measure value specifically um, or at least not be accurate with it, um, which doesn't to them negate the value or the um, importance of Marx's analysis. They just don't see it as being a necessarily empirical conversation. But then there are others who have tried to do this. Um, the only one that I've read is um, Paul Cockshot wrote the uh, Towards a New Socialism. And in that book, he does go into, uh, here, I'll just write it out. I mean, I'm sure almost everyone has heard of this. Um, heard of this book. And I'm uh, also totally disregarding the other guy who contributed to that book. Uh, uh, Alan Cottrell, I think. Anyway, they wrote a book about, like, basically, like, computerized planned economics. And in that book, they talk about um, uh, basically how to quantify uh, value as as like a labor input and it is there's there's um i'm not a mathematician by any stretch of the imagination so it was really hard for me to like approach their model from a critical perspective and be like oh no this is not accurate this isn't like true or whatever um but at face value as someone who's not familiar with mathematics it did seem very like convincing that like at the very least quantifying labor and value is possible and um I can't quite recall the specifics of how they do it. I took like extensive notes, but I haven't looked back at them in a while. Um, but yeah, they do manage to do that. And then they imply that they apply that um, process to develop like a model for planning, essentially. Um, so if you're interested, you can read that book. And uh, there's, I'm sure, other books out there that, that do talk about this and like attempt to apply it more uh, concretely um okay and then expanding brain asks um there are many who proclaim that the u.s is not interested in invading other countries for oil because the u.s has an oil surplus especially through fracking thoughts um yeah i i mean for first of all, there's there's plenty of other reasons to invade a country, um, but in, if we're talking specifically about oil, uh, I think that's kind of the point, right? Um, that the U.S. wants to maintain its surplus, and the only way to like maintain that is to use oil from not the U.S. You know that that like the more that they employ other people's resources, the less. They have to expand, uh, exhaust their own, and so the more that they keep those reserves available, like the relative uh, difference in ownership grows, right? Like if they use the world's resources but not their own, then 
their resources become like comparatively more valuable, right? Um, so I think like even at face value, I don't think that's necessarily true. And I think uh, also pretty uh, demonstrably false in the sense that a lot of the countries that the U.S. has invaded in the last hundred years have coincidentally had a lot of oil. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's a mistake because, yeah, there's also like controls of like oil flows are very critical. And um, yes, the petrodollar, um, the way that the dollar is connected to oil flows makes it so that it's um, in the interest of the United States to uh, basically be like the the valve, like control the valves, you know, like the control the flows. And um, yeah, you don't necessarily like they're not necessarily going there to like bring barrels of oil back to the U.S. or that like the, the U.S. is starved for oil necessarily. It is about like controlling like global networks. And they've done that successfully for a while. I don't know in recent years to what degree that's true anymore. But um Mm. Yeah, that's such a good question. <laughs> uh, I can very much see where people who make that claim are coming from because he does. Uh, he is the one who, like, you know, talks about dialectics using like scientific examples. And I haven't returned to those texts in a while, but I want to say that um, Engels probably did have a faith in dialectics as like some something akin to a science in the sense that, you know, we now understand chemistry and biology and physics and whatnot. Um, but it could also have been for like the sake of demonstration and that the use of scientific examples, quote unquote, was um, kind of like a rhetorical thing to like add to the validity of dialectics, but like, like kind of like an example in a textbook, you know, um, but to, that that like you were saying the greater question i guess is to what degree do we need to understand angles to understand uh marxism and um i think like for me the issue there rests on um treating marx almost like in a biblical sense you know that like the word of marx is necessarily true and the closer you are to it the more marxist you are <laughs> Um, and I know that no one at face value makes that argument, but it's an argument that I've definitely seen implied, you know, like, oh, that my interpretation of Marx is more truly Marxist because, you know, it's closer to Marx's uh, own words. And I think that for me, Marxism is like, a, it's eclectic and it's uh, developmental in the sense that like, it isn't one there isn't like a true form of it and then like interpretations of it that are closer or not closer to it. Uh, I think like in a very relativistic sense, uh, Engels contribution to Marxism is just as valid as any of the other contributions to Marxism. Like they don't hold any specific um, ontological primacy over each other, you know, that like Engels, I guess, was influenced by Marx and I would definitely say to a degree vice versa. Uh, they were, after all, really close in their time in terms of like what they w wrote and worked on. Um, so I think that he has, you know, it's 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 valid to consider him as part of the Marxist canon. I know some people uh, reject volumes two and three because Engels heavily revised them, um, and therefore it's not like the actual word of Marx. But we have to remember that you know, Marx is not <clears throat> some kind of like all-knowing divine entity that you know, his word is the final word. And if we just acknowledge that it is sort of like all horizontal in terms of like the development of the theory and that like Marx had good points, but then Engels built on them and, and then people who followed like, you know, like Lenin and all of the like 20th century scholars. And uh, yeah, I just think it's perfectly fine that um, some things don't necessarily, aren't necessarily, um, what's the word, cohesive. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pluralism, and that's that's good, I think. <laughs> but it's a good question, though. I don't know. I've heard, I've seen a lot of that like back and forth before. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly we certainly see a lot of commodities today, or things that have become commodified that are like so abstract and bizarre 
um, but yet they're still sold on the market and there is like a market for them, um, you know, but I think that it is, it is a subjective thing to a degree. Um, but like that essentially like once it does fulfill, uh, once it does have a use for someone, it necessarily becomes a commodity. Um, that's, that's like how the definition is sort of complete and closed in is, um, you know, if someone wants to purchase mud pies for some reason for their personal use, then, um, then it is a commodity. Even if that use is to disprove the labor theory of value, to them that becomes a use in and of itself, right? And therefore the mud pie becomes a commodity. It's like a bit tautological, I feel like, uh, Marx's definition here that, you know, com it's only a commodity when it becomes useful to someone. Um, and it's like almost true by nature of what he's trying to say. Um, but yeah, so I mean, anything can in fact be a commodity if, if there's people who want it. And I think that actually, uh, on that note, there's an interesting part in volumes two and three, mostly in three, I think, where Marx finally starts talking more about like luxury commodities, which is an interesting concept that I would like to explore more myself. Like uh, oftentimes when we're reading Marx's theory, we're reading like about like linen and clothing and like, you know, flax and stuff like that. And those are all pretty demonstrably useful commodities. Uh, but then, you know, what do you, what about things like bath water that people sell online? You know, like something super pointless, uh, at face value, right? Like luxury items that aren't like used in any kind of production or for any kind of subsistence. Um, and Marx does talk about that in volume three to a degree, uh, but I think that it's a fairly limited discussion because he doesn't get to it. Um, and I'd like to see, I'd like to read more about that myself, honestly. But I think to the degree that uh, it's a sellable item that is produced with labor, it's a commodity. sure yeah thank you everyone for listening uh yeah i hope there was some useful insight there uh and you can always reach out to me if you have questions about things that you're learning or reading about if you want to find other resources i can def i mean obviously this channel <laughs> can do way more than i can do in terms of giving you resources but i, I can certainly try and point you in the right direction